Good evening. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for August 20th, 2019. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Claire and Grace Jabaji, representing Timonium Elementary and Delaney High School. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the August 20th, 2019 agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no changes to tonight's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session are available on our um, website. An informational summary can be found at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. Our next item is item D, selection of speakers. Sign up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's board meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. Our first speaker tonight is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Our second speaker is Michael Baer. And we only have two speakers signed up for tonight. Thank you. Our next item of business is special order of business, portrait unveiling of former board chair. And uh, for that, I ask that Dr. Williams and Mr. Gillis please join me up front. I'd like to move the following resolution uh, for Mr. Edward Gillis. And I can't even see the smile that I'm sure he has on his face to hear me say that. <laughs> Whereas Edward J. Gillis Esquire has served as a member of the Board of Education of Baltimore County honor from July 2013 through November 2018, and whereas he has provided exemplary service to the students, parents, and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools. As chair of the board for two consecutive years, 2017 and 2018, and whereas Mr. Gillis has worked actively for the achievement of all Baltimore County students with focus on raising the bar and el eliminating achievement gaps. And whereas he has served on the following Board of Education committees, 
Audit, where he served as vice chair and a member of the curriculum committee. And whereas Mr. Gillis, as, as chair, represented the Board of Education admirably at numerous state and county events, and whereas he always placed the needs of all students as his first priority, and whereas Mr. Gillis has uh, committed his time and expertise to the Baltimore County Public Schools community, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education of Baltimore County herewith assembled in regular session on the 20th day of August in the year 2019 recognizes the outstanding contribution of Mr. Edward Gillis, Esquire, and be it further resolved that the board does herewith extend its deep appreciation and gratitude for his dedication, loyalty, and service, and further extends its best wishes for good health, happiness, and continued success. And I so move that for the board. Second. All in favor? And the board is unanimous. That motion carries. Congratulations, Mr. Gillis. So first of all, um, it is really nice being on this side, this side of the dais instead of that side. So thanks to all you for all you do now. Uh, second of all, you met my wife, Barb, uh, and as all of you back here know, and many of you know out here, it takes more than one person to serve on a board like this. So I uh, extend my uh, thanks to Barb for all she's done over these six years. Um, the Baltimore County Public Schools has been an important part of Barb's in my life. All our kids either went all of their years of public education um, in Baltimore County Public Schools, or most of those years. Um, and, it and the county school system served our children very, very well. Um, and when I had the opportunity to serve on the board, it was just a great extension of time after being a PTA president and other things to uh, continue to have involvement with the system. I can tell you I've been on many boards over my years, um, but none has uh, uh, required as, as much time, none has required uh, or has uh, required as much uh, diligence, and surely uh, upon reflection none was as rewarding as serving on this Baltimore County School Board. And we all know that the heavy lift that the school board does uh, is to ensure that uh, equitable distribution of dollars um, are committed so that everyone, all 115,000 students in this great county, uh, get a, an excellent public education. And we know an excellent public, public education uh, is uh, paramount for a strong community. So I thank you all for um, honoring me and for this wonderful picture. And our next item of business is new business personnel matters. Uh, for that, we call forward Ms. Lowry to present the personnel matters. Good evening. 
Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like to ask the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements and resignations. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F-1 and F-2? So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. The next item of business is administrative appointments. I call on Dr. Williams to present the administrative appointments. Madam Chair and the members of the board, I would like to bring forward the, for your approval the following administrative appointments. Assistant Principal at Deep Creek Middle School, Assistant Principal at Grange Elementary School, Assistant Principal at Middle Borough Elementary School, Assistant Principal at Pikesville High School, the Chief Academic Officer in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction, the Senior Executive Director in the Division of Curriculum and Instruction, the Executive Director of Academics in the Department of Academics, <laughs> Supervisor of the Office of Student Support Services, the Specialist Birth to Five in the Office of Special Education, two positions, pupil personnel worker in the Office of School Climate, and two positions as the Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit G1? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. As I call your name, please stand. I'd like to present Renard Adams as the Senior Executive Director in the Division of Curriculum Instruction. Dr. Adams has been with us for 11.9 years in Baltimore County. He served as the Interim Senior Executive Director in the Office of Curriculum and Instruction, the Executive Director in the Department of Research Accountability and Assessment, Director of Performance Management in the Department of Research Accountability and Assessment. He was also the coordinator in that same department and a coordinator in the School Support and Compliance. Prior experience, he served with Johns Hopkins University for three years and Kennedy Krieger for six years. Congratulations, Dr. Adams. The next candidate is Michael Banak. Please stand. Assistant Principal at Pikesville High School. Uh, welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. He is coming from Anne Arundel County Public Schools where he served as the Department Chair of Health, Physical Education and Dance at Meade High School. He, he also served as the Teacher of Physical Education and Health, Leadership Assistant to Administration, Teacher of World Language, Spanish, and Assistant Director of Athletics, all at Meade High School, and served as a teacher of Spanish and physical education at George Fox Middle School in Anne Arundel County. To this evening, supporting him is his wife, Theone Ventura, um, present to this evening. Congratulations and welcome. <laughs> Our next candidate is Mary Boswell McComas as the Chief Academic Officer in the Division of Curriculum Instruction. She brings to us currently 4.3 years in Baltimore County. She served previously as the Interim Chief Academic Office Officer in the Division of Curriculum Instruction the Executive Director in Academics in the Department of Academics. She served as the Coordinator, Professional Growth and Partnership in the Department of Organizational Development. And prior to Baltimore County, she served in Baltimore City Public Schools for 2.8 years and Hartford County Public Schools for 16 years. Her family will be watching from live stream. Congratulations, Dr. McCombs. Next, we have Donna Bupert, 
the assistant principal at Grange Elementary School. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. She's coming from Carroll County Public Schools as a classroom teacher of two years and a teacher, a kindergarten teacher for seven years. This evening, supporting her is her husband, Stuart Bupert, and mother, Anna Marie Schartbeck. Please stand. Welcome. Congratulations. Thank you. Next, we have Heather Chantelot, who's a specialist, birth to five in the Office of Special Education. Uh, she brings to us 23 years of experience in Baltimore County, where she has served as a resource teacher in the Office of Special Education, a resource teacher, special ed, infant and primary teacher, as well as a special ed teacher at Halstead Academy and Hallowthorpe Elementary School. Supporting her this evening, we have her children, Will and Kate Chantelo, Director Rebecca Ryder, Office of Special Education, and Coordinator Paula Boykin in the Office of Special Education. Congratulations. Next, we have Kenya Conway as a pupil personnel worker. Kenya is unable to attend tonight, but she brings two years of experience in Baltimore County, 15 years in Howard County Public Schools, and she was formerly a special ed teacher at Deer Park Middle School. Congratulations, Ms. Conway. <laughs> Next, we have Lance Hawkins position pupil personnel worker in the Office of School Climate. Uh, welcome to Baltimore County. Uh, he comes from Hartford County where with 10 years of experience as a counselor. He was a behavior specialist in Hartford County in the alternative education program for four years. He worked uh, in the school psychological associ associate in the National Children's Center for 3.5 years, a special ed teacher, a family service coordinator, and a case manager. Supporting him this evening is his wife, Vernell Hawkins, please stand, and their two children, Kayla and Isaac Hawkins. Congratulations. <laughs> Next we have Dominique Haynes. Position is Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. She comes from uh, several experiences outside of Baltimore County. She was the Transportation Services Manager in, in the Potomac School for 13 years, the Administrative Assistant for Transportation at the Potomac School, North Carolina Wise Data Manager and Secretary, and a Teacher Assistant. Supporting her this evening is her husband, please stand, Ryan Haynes. <laughs> Next, we have Sean Heiss, Senior Operations Supervisor in the Office of Transportation. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. He comes from outside of Baltimore County with the following experiences. <laughs> Commercial Lines Executive, uh, the Glad Fetter Agency for nine months, Principal in the Chesterbrook Academy Elementary School, Senior Associate of Federal Programs in the School District of Philadelphia, an Administrator in the Eastern York School District for 15 years, and a Supervisor in the York County Youth Development Center for years. His wife is unable to attend because she is traveling today. Congratulations and welcome. <laughs> Kia Isaacs, Assistant Principal Deep Creek Middle School. Um, she brings 17 years in Baltimore County. She was a former stat teacher in Deep Creek Middle School, a Spanish teacher at Randallstown High School in Old Court Middle, and prior experience, she had four years in Baltimore City Public Schools. Supporting her tonight is her husband, Ronald Isaacs, and her two children, Kendra and Cameron Isaacs. Please stand. Congratulations. <laughs> Next, we have Karen Jabaji, Supervisor in the Office of uh, Support Services. Welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. Prior to this appointment, she was the nurse practitioner in the Baltimore County Public Schools uh, Base Wellness Center. 
and the Baltimore County Health Department serving Woodlawn, Owings Mill, and Parkville High Schools. She was a substitute school nurse in Baltimore County Public Schools for 1.3 years and a pediatric nurse practitioner of private practice for three years. Joining her tonight are her daughters, Grace, Eden, and Claire. Welcome. Next, we have Andrew Sands, the assistant principal at Middleborough Elementary School. You can't miss him back there, nice and tall. Um, he brings to us 13.6 years in Baltimore County, where he served as a classroom teacher at Villa Cresta Elementary, a special ed teacher inclusion at Villa Cresta Elementary School, and a special ed teacher at Riverview Elementary School. Supporting him tonight are the following, his wife, Samantha Sands, Former principal Jenny Raba, or Rorba, apologize, Villa Cresta Elementary School, and former assistant principal Heather Lundy, Villa Cresta Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Megan Shea as the executive, executive director in academics. She brings to us 22 years of experience in Baltimore County. She was the former executive director in academics. Director of Language Arts in the Office of Language Arts, Assistant Principal at Dundalk, a mentor or teacher at Dundalk, a resource teacher in the Office of Language Arts, a classroom che teacher at Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School, a facilitator at Chesapeake Terrace Elementary School, and a classroom teacher at Fullerton Elementary and Battle Grove Elementary. Congratulations, Ms. Shea. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and congratulations again, and welcome to all of our staff that are joining us. We're really looking forward to a wonderful school year ahead. Our next agenda item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive advice from community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone may be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. At any time, the public may submit comments to the board members in hard copy or via email to boe at bcps.org. I now call on our stakeholder groups to speak, and the first speaker for this evening is Councilman David Marks. Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much for giving elected officials the opportunity to testify. Good evening and thank you for your service to the citizens of Baltimore County. Uh, Dr. Williams, it's good to see you again. Uh, best wishes to you and all our staff and educators as we prepare for the beginning of the 2019-2020 academic year. Uh, our shared concerns uh, are, uh, have to do with school overcrowding and school renovation. Uh, I represent one of the most populous and fastest growing county council districts. Uh, the County Council has tried to lighten school overcrowding by downzoning land in my district in the 2012 and 2016 rezoning cycles. But as you know, most of our overcrowding is driven by demographic change as younger families move into neighborhoods from Towson to Perry Hall. Um, so despite some progress over the past few years, uh, as you know, our schools, many of our schools will open uh, well over capacity. Towson High School will open about 30% over capacity, Joppa View Elementary School 25% over, Perry Hall Middle School 14% over, Perry Hall Elementary School 20% over, and Fullerton 29% over. 
Um, as you look at capital funding for the upcoming year, um, I want to reiterate my support for resources to advance the new Northeastern Middle School, the new elementary school in Rossville Boulevard, uh, which as you know, both were delayed uh, largely by the lack of commitment from the state for funding. Additionally, I want to reiterate my strong support for a new Towson High School. Like Delaney and Lansdowne High Schools, and all three are important, this is an aging building that is by no definition meeting the standards we expect of a 21st century school. The county executive and county council made difficult decisions in the last budget to allocate resources for school construction. Uh, hopefully the state legislature will follow through with the Build to Learn Act next year as we partner to advance these projects. Thank you very much for your service to the children of Baltimore County. Thank you, Councilman Marks. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is the president of Teachers Association of Baltimore County, TABCO, Ms. Cindy Sexton. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. As we prepare for tomorrow's new teacher orientation, I think back to my own 18 years ago. At that same Perry Hall High School, where these some 1,100, who knows how many people are going to show up, will be gathering for the next two days. A new school year, new faces in so many of our schools and work sites, such promise and excitement. Well, as I said back to my own new teacher orientation, I don't know that I felt excitement as much as trepidation and angst, but I do remember the energy in that auditorium as we sat together that first day and I'm sure we'll feel that energy again tomorrow. And while many of those new teachers may not be aware of all the exciting changes and workings behind the scenes, they are sure to benefit from everything that is happening. From Dr. Williams' message, raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing for our future, to BCPS's mission statement, to ensure all children receive the best education possible, to TABCO's mission statement of achieving equity and excellence in public schools. These new educators will be part of a system where all parts are working together to do what is best for our students. I also want to thank the members of BCPS, the board, and the community that have already reached out to me to welcome me, to meet with me, and to include TABCO in the conversations as we move forward. Research has shown that collaborative education partnerships create substantive real-world benefits for students and educators, including but not limited to increases in student achievement and teacher retention, and we really all want that. I look forward to meeting with more of you soon so we continue this most important work. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is uh, Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome to you. Uh, before I start, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to uh, Cheryl Pastor for coming to see me on stage and being supportive to the theater group that I belong to. But I am here tonight to speak about something that is near and dear to my heart and is something that I brought to this board's attention numerous times and it doesn't seem to be uh, going anywhere, and I would like to see if we can change that conversation. Um, I'm talking about the uh, twice exceptional child. I have been working with several of those students this school year, and I don't see their needs being met. As a matter of fact, what I'm seeing is uh, individuals in administrative positions and individuals in the central office looking at those of us, and I am included in that realm of twice exceptional, as somewhat of a contradiction. And I take offense to that. I'm not a contradiction. Having a disability does not mean that I am stupid. Um, having a gifted ability does not mean I can't have a disability. Um, and that seems to be the continued stance of the school system. Um, and I'm not the only one that feels that way. There are other parents. 
There is a conversation again going on on Facebook and um, inside the GTCAC uh, group that notes we need to address this. When a parent asks for someone from the advanced academics office to come to an IEP meeting, we should respect that because they can lend something to the conversation that special ed may not be aware of and can benefit that child and benefit more than just that child because there's a ripple effect. And we're not willing to do, go that far. I have asked several times in the last two school years to have people from advanced academics to come to IEP meetings and I have been refused by the school and by the Office of Advanced Academics and the Office of Special Education. That needs to stop. If we are going to look at addressing all students in this county, I invite the board, Dr. Williams, the Office of Special Ed, and the Office of Advanced Academics to meet with me and to meet with other parents to get solutions going so that I don't have to come here again with this concern. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker is Mr. Bear. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, thank you. Uh, thank you for the time to speak to the board. I am Michael Bayer, representing the families living on Musgrove Road, a 100-year-old dead-end street in Lutherville. Uh, I have owned and lived in Mr. Musgrove's house for more than 20 years. Uh, earlier today, I sent you a copy of my remarks tonight and also the copy of the opening page of your recent boundary study for the Castanet Estates. The area in green, which was originally the Musgrove family farm, then the former Chestnut Ridge Golf Course, includes the property uh, that was under the study. The homes on the north side of this map are our Musgrove Road residences, demonstrating, demonstrating excuse me, that we've always been a part of a, quote, continuous neighborhood, end quote, geographically and historically. In our multiple communications with the study committee and the school board people beginning in last November, we have supported the recommendations of the committee and agreed with the decision of the board to assign all of the future Castaneda State homes to the Mays Chapel Elementary, Ridgewood Middle, Delaney High School District. Even before this study was done, other residences once part of the same original property as our Musgrove homes, excuse me, our Musgrove Road homes are, they were previously assigned to this school district. We belong in the same district too. Fairness, equitable treatment, and common sense should have you apply the same criteria and standards for our small number of residents as you used for Castanea. School proximity. Your own maps and diagrams, that is pages three and 10 of the study, show that our Musgrove Road homes are closer to Mays Chapel Elementary and Delaney High than most of the future Castanea homes. Boundary lines. Page four of the report states that the criteria for neighborhood and traffic characteristics that quote, follow a consistent pattern of boundary, end quote, include, quote, a dead-end street, end quote. Clearly, our very dead, old dead-end street fits this criteria. Yield impact. Presently and for the foreseeable future, the Musgrove Road pupil yield is zero. That's unlike Castanea Estates. Our community will, quote, have no significant impact on utilization or feeder pattern, end quote. Rule 1280. This rule has been used on multiple occasions as a reason to reject our position. However, it has never been our claim that we should have been included in the boundary study, nor is it applicable to the narrow issue we are raising. But Section 4A does actually address our unique status. Quote, considerations may include, but are not limited to maintaining the continuity of neighborhoods, end quote. The Musgrove Road homes are the beginning of the neighborhood. No boundary study is needed to see the obvious. On January 30th, Ms. Causey wrote that she would meet with me to review this information. Still anticipating that meeting, my appearance today is to ensure that we move forward to a fair and logical and equitable manner. Again, thank you for your attention. I'm representing the Musgrove Road folks. Thank you. That concludes our public 
comment portion of the meeting. Our next item is item I, unfinished business, Watershed Public Charter School. For that, I'll ask Mr. Nussbaum to come forward to present the Watershed Public Charter School contract. Following the presentation, allow time for discussion if the board desires. Good evening. Good evening. Before you this evening is a, uh, an agreement uh, between the Board of Education of Baltimore County and the Watershed Public Charter School. This document was uh, discussed and negotiated between the charter school uh, folks and the school system administration. Uh, it is presented to you uh, after agreement has been reached between the superintendent and the administration of the school system as well as the charter school uh, folks. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the Watershed Public Charter School Incorporated contract? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Is there any discussion, questions, or comments? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstained? Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. Thank you. And we now call on you uh, to discuss consideration of action taken in closed session. Yes, thank you. Earlier this evening, the board considered two appeals regarding confidential employee and student matters in your quasi-judicial capacity. Uh, both of these matters were considered on the record as there were no requests uh, timely made for oral argument. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken in that closed session in those matters which were hearing examiner numbers 18-56 and 19-45. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? second? Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motions carry unanimously. Thank you, and the orders are on the desk for signature. Yes, thank you. Thank and we'll you. note that uh, the student member of the board will yeah. only vote on the one item. That's right. Thank, thank you. you. The next item is report on policies. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed changes to the following board policy. Policy 1600, Community Relations, Public Charter Schools. Policy 5120, Students, Enrollment and Attendance, Attendance and Excuses. Policy 6102, Instruction, Curriculum, Teaching of Controversial Issues. Policy 6200, Instruction, Instructional Services, School Libraries. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit K. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstained? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The next item is item L, new business. Work session on the proposed fiscal year 2021 state capital budget request. The Board of Education will review the attached superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2021 state capital budget recommendation and the fiscal year 2020 final approved budget for discussion at this work session on uh, at this work session this evening and the board will take action on it on Tuesday September 10th state funded project requests require verification of county matching funds before final state approval and we ask uh, Mr. Saris and Mr. Smith to come forward excuse me Mr. Dixit but Mr. Smith can always join us following any presentation there will be time for board discussion Good evening and welcome. Good evening. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Williams, um, we've come to you tonight to um, address any questions you may have, as well as to give an overview of the process as it relates to the 
completion, the introduction, and the vote on the state capital request. As you may recall, the state capital request is a continuation of a, of a fluid document that moves over the priority of that projects that we have. As you may recall from previous years, some of the projects may no longer exist because either those projects have been completed and have been fully funded and they come off the list and then others will add to the list. However, this list, um, our request has been a pretty large request for the last three or four years, so we have more requests than we have funding that comes from the state, and we work closely with our both our sto state and local partners in relations to, to make sure that the projects are priority ordered and move forward as your will from the recommendation to the superintendent related to what you approve in the capital plan. Um, I'm joined by Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit, who will help address any questions you may have. Mr. Dixit is gonna briefly go through the um, components of the one pager that you have from a previous presentation that we gave. He's not gonna go line by line, but he's just gonna group it so you'll know the columns, the categories. This is the standard um, template that is used by the state in order to prioritize your state request that we, were, that we have each and every year. I know that you have um, been an integral in making sure that we um, move this process forward, all while coupled with the uh, creation and the development and working closely with our county partners on the 10-year capital plan. Um, you'll hear me say that a lot tonight and nights moving forward because I think we're all excited about the opportunity to develop a 10-year capital plan which will plan out our capital projects for the next 10 years and it will be more of a roadmap of how we do the work of capital planning in conjunction with our work with boundaries and uh, um, enrollment and capacity as we move forward through this work. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Dixit, who will go through briefly the categories of what we have, and then he will briefly categorize the groupings of projects that we have, whether they're replacements, systemics, or elementary, or whatever the case may be. Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Mr. Smith, and good evening. Uh, what you have in front of you are two attachments. Mm -hmm. One of them is the county budget that we had shared with you last year. That was the FY 2020 county request. The second attachment that you have is of our proposed 2021 state budget. For sake of clarification, we have two different cycles going on here. The first cycle that we are presenting to you is the state cycle. Later on, we'll come to you in December, January with the county cycle. Since most of you were here last year, we had shared in detail about what different columns mean and what the process is. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna repeat that, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask that. What I thought will help you is clarify some of the changes that are made in the 2021. Even though our priorities remain the same, which is air conditioning, new seats, additional seats, and infrastructure improvement, some of the projects have already been fully funded. So if you look at your state FY 2021 submission, priorities one, two, three, and four from last year have already been fully funded. So they are removed from the FY 2021 request. All that it means is that the state is not going to fund, not provide any additional money. They have given us all the funds that we need for that project. In addition to that, priorities six and eight were for planning, and the state has approved that, so they have been removed. That shows the rest of the exhibit is identical to the one that we shared with you. There is no change in priority, and I want to emphasize that because we hear sometimes rumors, there is no change made in any of the priorities that board has already approved. So the priorities remain the same as we shared with you. Again, summarizing, Huntingo Elementary School has been fully funded. Renovations to Patapsco and Woodlawn have been fully funded. Replacement of Dundalk Elementary School has been fully funded. The planning requests for Colgate and Chadwick have been fully, fun, fully have been approved and removed. The systemic priorities that you see there, which is infrastructure improvements, they, they include roof replacement, 
boilers and chiller, all of the requests that we had submitted to you in FY20, they were funded by county. They were fully funded by county with the exception of two projects. That's Hollaburn Middle School and Stonely Elementary School's roof. And we have resubmitted that in fiscal 21. In addition to that, we have added seven roof replacement projects uh, in the 2021 request. Uh, we have also added two boilers, Milford Mill Academy and Dundalk Middle School, and two new chiller systemics at Lock Raven High School and Perry Hall High School. These are some of the changes that we have made or additions we have made for infrastructure improvement, and that's in, in front of you. I do want to emphasize what Mr. Smith just indicated. It's a fluid document. It changes every couple of months, and we adjust it. This is the time when we take to share with you some of the changes, and that's what you see here. With that, I'm ready to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, uh, we'll go around. Ms. Rowe, Ms. Mack, and then Ms. Hen. So, it's my understanding from press releases that the county executive allocated in the county request planning money for Lansdowne High School, but I see the approved county request here, but I don't see that allocation. And I don't see that allocation in any documents that are provided. And I need to see the allocation in a document. Otherwise, then I ask myself, is it just a press release? Because there should be documentation for allocations. Yeah. It, it has been our, our process to include county allocation in, of the planning funds in the county share of the funding. So what you see here in the county share that includes planning money. And when we come to you in December, January for county uh, funding, you'll see that the share of the county money is there and that includes uh, planning money for Lansdowne. So in the county share, I see zero. Shouldn't I see $15 million? You see zero, you see $15 million or so what that in the, the county share of the project includes planning money. If you see right. the, if you see the county of the submission of the last year, you'll see a dollar amount there, and that'll have the- Talking about the 2020 county capital budget request final approved. Yeah. Is that the document that you're telling me I should look at? Yeah, the land's down, let me because see. Because I see zero straight across in that Pri document. Prior to the end of the final capital project, Lansdown was not identified as um, the project moving forward. That was announced after this was voted on. Yeah. The, the, the next submission of the, of the, of county, the county portion will include, will include that $15 million related to, in the previous one, it was a footnote of $30 million. Be in the county 2021 request? That's correct. That is correct. It'll As be a in. previously funded allocation. As a current funded, because it was before it was earmarked, this time it is being released to move forward with the planning of that particular project. So before it was earmarked, because those projects were not identified, which projects were moving forward. We did them as a block that were in placeholders, but now the first project has been identified as the first project moving forward for the high schools, which is Lansdowne High School. So next you will see that the $15 million of planning dollars will be allocated on the state portion for that project in the, in the county capital request that will come forward to you in December. So here's the problem I'm having with what you're saying. Okay. Last fall when we, well, winter-ish, when we got sworn in and we got launched into the county capital request, yes, we were told that it's tied to the previous state request mm -hmm. and that if we make changes, blah, 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 you, you'll mess up the whole ducks in a row with the state request. Well, so now here we are with the state request and I would expect to see a county contribution of $15 million in that Lansdowne line if we're expecting to see it on the FY21 county request. 
and I don't see it. I see zero straight across. If you see because the, the two requests are tied together, because you told me they are. If, if you look at the state request, it does not show county share in any of the projects. It does. It says uh, county prior funding appropriation. No, look at this. Total state. county funding. I'm looking. Okay, at the, at the FY state. 21. Yes. Okay, FY 21. It, it does not show any county share. When we come back to you in December you'll see the county share, and that will include $15 million. Oh, no, I don't like that this table doesn't show us county share. It did in the past. Because this, this is submitted to state, and they want to know the state share of the project. But so that's you, part of the process. You're also required to submit the county share to the state, so we should have that information too. That information is prepared in January. That board would approve that information in January. So while we have shared with the state what the, the big book that you'll get of the submission. When do I get that book? That comes in the first week of October. The first week of October. Yeah. When do we approve this budget? September. September. So the I don't get the book with all the information until after we've approved the budget. You, you're approving that the priority order of the budget for these projects are moving forward. As we said before, the 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 flow and the movement of how the process has not changed. The only difference has been first submission is the state capital request, which is what you have in, for, in front of you now, that lists our priority orders and how we move forward. Then the county, working with our team in the state, overlays what they're going to support as it relates for the county portion and then that is shared with the state as we move through the process. So I, I certainly understand your question, but the process has not changed as it relates to how we submit to the state and then ultimately to the county. And then those two pieces are combined, which gets you to the final of last year that has the multiple columns. As you can see, the FY20 uh, request that we have in front of you now has fewer columns because it doesn't include the local funding, because we haven't gotten to that point yet, as we're working with the county on items they're going to fund. We, we know now that the $15 million as it relates to the planning for Lansdowne was introduced, as you said, in the, in the press release. That will, we're certainly I mean, looking forward to seeing that as we put together the county portion of the state request, of the capital request. So, the timeline of this is really messed up. At what point does this board have anything to do at all? Why, why, why do we vote on this? Because the information that we have to need to make a decision isn't really here. The information you need is the first request is about priority order. Which projects does this board want to move forward with? Those projects have been on our capital plan for, mm -hmm. I think, three, maybe four years now. So we're just moving those projects forward. So right. the final request that will come, no, I'm sorry, the approval that comes on September 10th is to say that this is indeed the priority order, that we're going to continue to seek funding, both state and local funding, that we've been in consultation with both our state funding agencies and our local funding agencies to move the projects that this board has wanted to move forward, and we'll go through the process of getting the various funding components, and we're hopeful that the state component will come together as it was requested last year from the county executive, the superintendent council, and this board. So, so I'm not objecting necessarily to this specific priority order. Yes, ma'am. But I also know that there's a lot of other needs in the county, like Pleasant Plains is 138% capacity, and it's nowhere on this list. Yes, ma'am. And so my question here is I've been watching these proceedings for a number of years now, mm -hmm. and what I'm seeing is that the list appears, new projects get added, the board approves it, they're told they'll get more information later on, but where is the deliberative process to decide how we get Pleasant Plains on this list? Somewhere, anywhere. Well, where I, are we with the long-term capital plan? How's that, because I'm not really satisfied with the continuing cycle of having budgets brought, we approve the budget as it's presented to us, but where is the board action for actually setting the agenda of 
people come to us and say they have these problems with their school facilities and we keep waiting for something. What do we do about Pleasant Plains? I understand you're going to do a boundary study, but that's not really going to solve their problem because there's nowhere to move these kids to. Yes. So tell me about the long-term plan. Are we doing this? As we reported before, the long-term capital plan is underway. Um, our team has had several meetings with the county team as we get to that. At some point in time, a scope of work is going to be presented to the superintendent and for the board for review. That process is well underway. We're excited about where we are. And hopefully from that process, projects such as Pleasant Plains and many, many more all around this county will be made a part of that from a engaging collaborative community process that will get away from what you're referring to because now we have a program list for 10 years with input from multiple communities, both boards, the superintendent and his team, the county executive and his team. So at that point in time, hopefully all minds will be on the same accord. Bear in mind, the list is priority list. If we listed every project here, then that's not a that's that's a that's a different kind of list. These are the priority lists based on what our funding allocations have been previously. We normally get anywhere between 35 to 50 million dollars from the state. The county's portion depends on depends on what the bonding referendums are. So. The, the goal is to get additional dollars to move these projects forward and then any new projects that will come as, as the development of the 10-year capital plan, those projects will be incorporated in further versions of the, the capital plan. The, the reason that this is important is that if you keep making tweaks to this plan here, the state doesn't really know what truly are your priorities. And these priorities, we, we had three three or four common things. AC was on the top of the list before. As those projects were relieved, they come off the list. So you may still have that as a priority because we do have some schools that have not been fully completed as it relates to AC. Those will continue, will continue that process. The infrastructure and the elementary seats will be addressed. And now the incorporation of a middle school and the high school will be addressed. So um, I, I know the process has been um, awkward, but it is the state process that all localities have to endure, and we do it, and this is not um, pointing that to the state. This is to say, this is our process. This is how it's done. How we need to do is we need to find ways to improve that, and I think that with this board support and the vision that of our superintendent, we have gotten to a point where the 10-year capital plan should be the roadmap for projects such as Pleasant Plains to get on a subsequent capital plan. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And with Ms. Mack's deference, I would um, now let Ms. Hen ask a question, make a comment. Thank you, Mrs. Causey, is that, if that's okay with you, Ms. Mack. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. Um, my question is for Mr. Smith, so you're still it's, in the hot seat, sir, uh, if you don't mind. It's, it's okay. I'm good. And you, you touched on some points, which I think answer um, my question in part, but I think it would be useful for the board to hear it again, if you don't mind summarizing. And this has multiple parts, so I'm happy to repeat this, okay. but I'll, I'll try the best I can. Okay. Um, would you please speak to the 2021 state capital request in its current form and your level of confidence in the process moving forward with securing state funding for the projects listed as currently prioritized by the board, how realistic would you say the request is? Does it meet the current greatest needs of the system? And what would be the impact should the board decide to make any changes to the request at this point? Thank you. Um, Thank you. The current capital plan for FY21 is a continuation of the priorities that have been set by previous boards and now this board. It does not take into effect, but it does not limit the ability to look at other projects. However, the list is the list is longer than the resources that we get annually. So if you keep adding to the list, you make the binder thicker, but then it, it potentially could could convolute the process that takes place at the state. As Ms. Rowe is aware, and we've, we've sat down with the binder before, and that is something that she reads thoroughly, that binder lists 
all of the various components and facets of a single project, which may be 35, 40 documents related to each, each individual project. So this capital plan is a continuation of the work that has been laid by this board to move forward. Uh, ch changing, changing course now um, would run the risk of complicating this request moving forward because this request has already gone through one level of vetting from previous years because nothing's changed other than projects coming off. Now going into this year, the state is gonna say, oh, your request has been consistent for the last two or three years, so they, they pretty much have a robust plan, knowing full well that in subsequent years, others could go on. So I wanna be careful in how I respond to that. We just wanna be mindful of the fact that we know that there are gonna be other priorities gonna, that's gonna come into play. I hope that we can address that moving forward through our 10-year capital plan and how we look at projects in totality as opposed to putting them on one at a time because that, that sometimes could make our interaction with IAC and the state as it relates to are you sure what your priorities are? And that's, that's why keeping a consistent priority list and moving this list through, it shows that when the state gets it that these projects have gone through the vetting process and, and have been consistent as we move through the process. That was a lot, but I hope I answered all of your components. Yeah, I think you did, thank you. And <laughs> one piece, um, how are you feeling about this, this request, if you could summarize the overall feeling of the system? And Mr. Dixit mentioned these are the priorities, this is what we, we aim to do and set out to do, and they've been the priorities of this board and previous boards. You mentioned AC, elementary seats, middle and high school seats now. How's everyone feeling about, about this request in, in, in that it's able to address the greatest needs of the school, school system because we're, that's what this board is about, about serving kids and about tackling the greatest needs. We know that the list is much longer, but again, we know that the, the funding is limited. So are we addressing the greatest needs given the expected funding with the capital re request as it stands now. So how I would answer that question is that we, we, we truly have needs that extend past what the, our resources. So these are the priorities as it relates to the current greatest needs that we have. It does not, um, it, it does not stymie any of the, of the needs that we have that are not on this list. The key with the state is being consistent with your requests until they come off. If you keep moving them back and forth, at, I think that gives the appearance that they're not particularly sure which projects they want to move forward. We have been, we have been very consistent with our theme over the last four years, AC, seats, and infrastructure. That all incorporates the current program we have now and any others that may be affected, Pleasant Plains. It doesn't mean that Pleasant Plains is on the list. It means it is, it is indeed in those categories, but as we get these projects off, I'm sure this board working with the superintendent will have other projects that will come on. You just have to realize this is a very robust list that will exceed what you will get in one full year. If you keep adding to the list until we get more off the list, it, it creates that I'm not sure what their priorities are and I, I'm confident that this board doesn't want to do that because we have a plan that is working based on our conversation here. I can't, I can't change the state process. The state process is what it is and if it's cumbersome to you, I imagine it's cumbersome to every LEA in the state. That is what the process is. First is the state piece, then as we work through that process, we identify what the local piece will be as it relates. And what that is, is basically saying, the county is saying, your state submission, we're indemnifying that we agree or not to fund that moving forward. So at some point in time, the state request that comes from our priority list that will happen on September 10th, will we'll then, it's our, our um, roles to work with the superintendent to engage the county staff on here's what the priority is it's it's unchanged here are what we're requesting how do you mirror your dollars to make that a, a reality we're going to get that 15 million dollars now before it was a footnote i would suspect in the next county submission 
it's no longer a footnote because it's been introduced and that's where we're moving forward. That's how the process is going to go. Great. So last point, just to make sure my understanding is correct, what I'm hearing you say is that we have a plan. The plan's been vetted. It meets not all of our needs, Correct. but it meets our priorities as they stand. The priorities are the priorities. It's important that the priorities are consistent and that this plan has been vetted. The state knows what to expect. We've ha um, sent this to the state over the past three years at least. We're completing projects in priority order as projects are finished. Those, you know, rise to the top and we're working that plan. Is that an accurate statement? That is an accurate statement. The only caveat what I, I will add is the state is currently aware that we are actively engaged in a 10-year capital plan. So that was something that we could not share with them before because we were not there. Now they know Pete has informed them that we are actively engaged in putting together a 10-year capital plan with our school board and our county council superintendent and county executive. But without that 10-year capital plan being complete, we still need to move forward with what we have, which is the current capital request. Is that correct? That is correct. To, to stay on the state process the in state order process. to receive the funding at the levels 25, 50, 75, and 90. We got to stay on that process and we have to have some semblance of order and process to, to how we do this. It's a little bit convoluted, but it, it works in the end. Yes, ma'am. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack. Lucky for you, Mr. Smith, that Ms. Rowe and Ms. Hent um, asked most of the questions I was going to ask. I have one simple question. Um, how confident are you that at the end of this process, the $15 million for Lansdowne High School will be in the um, I'm only as confident as to when I see the, the funding gets, get there. Unfortunately, I've been in this business a long time, so until I see it there, it's not there. What I can say is, in our conversations with our county partners thus far, that priority hasn't changed one iota as it relates to what the announcement was. So from past experience, when the county says that they're going to indemnify a project, it typically moves forward as the funding. So I, I'm pretty confident that it's going to be there, but um, my... I know uh, you don't have a my, crystal ball. Right. I have to leave that. As Mr. Dixon said, we have to be optimistic that we have to prepare for every scenario in case something happens. We're prepared to address that with our county partners. Well, thank you for your pretty confident answer. I tried. Mr. I tried. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. I want to discuss Patapsco High School, so I thoroughly understand this. As I look across this chart, if I'm at total state funding for Patapsco High School is $18,611,000, and the county total funding is $21,358,000. So I total those up, $39,969,000 has been spent at Patapsco High School. Is that accurate? The total amount is a little more than that. I don't have the exact amount, but uh, this is the total budgeted amount, and we may have spent a little more. But the good news is project is going to be completed, the school opening. Okay. Time. And I just want to make sure that I understand. Yes. Now, this was a limited renovation. That's right. So there was no seats added in this situation. I was actually told that we lost a couple seats because the nurse's suite was expanded and it used up a classroom. Is that accurate? We will not add any seats. We've actually lost a couple seats. Is that accurate? We have not added any seat. Whether we lost five or ten seats or gained, I don't know. But we have not added any seat. Okay. So we spent... $39 million, we haven't added any seats, and we still have, is it accurate that we have 18 trailers at that site, or cottages, or whatever you want to call them? Some of them will be removed. I was told there was 25 during construction, uh, seven no. will be removed, and there's 18 still on that site. Uh, number appears to be correct. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we're still overcrowded at Patapsco High School. Yes. Dundalk High School is overcrowded, and Spares Point High School is overcrowded. That is correct. Yeah, it confirms the point that Mr. Smith was making earlier, that we have competing priorities. We need seats all over the place. We need infrastructure improvement all over the place. And there's only so much that we can include in this request. So you are correct. 
Okay, and I just want to add this, that before Dr. Brown left, and I want to paraphrase, Dr. Brown made the statement, and I want to paraphrase, I'm not going to quote him exactly, but he said we needed to look at the situation at the high schools in the southeast area, specifically Dundalk, and, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not quoting him, Dundalk, Patapsco, and Sparrows Point, we needed to look at them soon or quickly, because if we didn't in 10 years, that was really going to come back to get us because we haven't addressed that issue now. Thank you, that's my point, thank you. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. And I'm gonna continue picking, piggybacking on uh, what Mr. McMillian said. Um, I remember the quote from, Mr. The, from Dr. Brown, because I do capital infrastructure planning, that the problem today is not one of our making, but if we don't prioritize our projects correctly, it will be a, a problem of our making, and I remember that. So I think it's very important this board prioritizes our projects accurately. When I see schools that do not have a capacity or seed problem, but they're getting a whole new school, it uh, raises flag for me. If it's just an infrastructure problem, a renovation could do. And he put out an excellent point with Patapsco. That was a total renovation when there was a seat it looks like there was a seat. Uh, uh, th that's, that's somewhat true, but not totally true, because part of the priorities was also air conditioning. So the option we had in some of these schools is just to provide air conditioning, and, it, and in a school like Patapsco or Woodlawn, it would not be cost efficient just to provide air conditioning and not renovate the building. For example, the cost of air conditioning alone could have been more than half the total project budget. And you go there and you don't change ceiling, you don't change light, you, do, you don't change some of the other things. It's not effective use of limited available resources. So when you go in those places, instead of only doing the central air conditioning, you do all of the other cost effective items that need as part of renovation. So that's what happened at Patasco, and that's what happened at Woodlawn because it was combined. It was infrastructure and air conditioning both added together. Mm -hmm. And that was the most cost effective way of doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Cool. Um, just so that we're all very clear, you made a statement earlier that we receive around $45 million in state funding a year. On average, yes, On sir. average, right. So that would, looking at the state funding, 21 capital request by priority order, that puts us in the, the top three, the three scores, the three top schools would be basically all of that funding. I'm, I'm gonna make this complicated, but I'm gonna try not to. There's a cash flowing mechanism that the state uses that they don't necessarily take the very top three, they, they're gonna fund them, but they, they, they may not fund them all for those projects. They may spread that on four or five projects because they fund projects that are multiple years. They don't put all the money in one place at one time because they know we won't have it built by that time. So just fa factor that in in your thought process that the cash flowing of that may be multiple years. So the 45 million may hit more than three projects, may hit five projects or six, six projects, depending on their schedule of completion. Okay, so basically, we've got a bunch of projects that we wanna run, and you're saying we can do $13 million worth of work on this project. I'm just looking at your list here, okay. about 13 million on this one, mm -hmm. 10 million on this one, blah, 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 mm -hmm. for this year. But we're still gonna need money in outgoing years possibly to finish some of those, and then we'll be starting new projects. That's kind of what this list. So, somewhat, mm -hmm. the state portion, let's just say for one school is $14 million. Yes. That's the total state piece, but they may only fund 3.9 million for year one, and the, let's keep it round numbers. They may, they may fund $4 million in year one, and 10 in year two, so they'll cash flow it, so we may not for that particular request of $14 million, they may not fund the full $14 million in year one. It may be year two or three as the project is coming to completion. So the 
so what you see under the state request for these projects, that's the, that's the total amount that we're applying for for that project mm -hmm. that could be funded in multiple years as they cash flow it. I okay. hope that helped. Okay. Thank you. That does help. But with all that said, we've got 20, 30 projects here. Um, but the expectation is at most we're going to see state money for about five of these projects, correct? About 35 to $50 million. So, so, yeah. so basically it's kind of like a, a slow conveyor belt of projects, mm -hmm. right? And the prioritizing that is sitting here um, I think is what Ms. Rowe was talking about and focusing on a bit because if you get past, say, number 10, just to be safe, mm -hmm. we really have no chance unless there's a bonanza of money coming from the state, and, and hopefully that'll happen next year, but we know it's not going to happen immediately, that we're going to have those capital dollars right away. So if we wanted to change the priority listing there, my question to you is, is that really impactful because there's no plan and or money to execute on any of it yet. Um, that is hugely impactful. E even though the state only funds to a certain level, we also have another component is the county component, which for what has happened in Baltimore County keeps our projects in some respects moving Faster, than, faster than what the state allocations. Hence, you heard that conversation that was stirring over the last several years about forward funding. That happens when, you, when you're putting state, you're putting local dollars up in anticipation of future state dollars coming. So to your point, yes, the state is only gonna fund what their portion is gonna be, but the other projects that we have here with our concurrence with our county funding agents, some of those projects have been able to move forward. And some of the planning dollars that we don't get from the state, Mr. Dixit and Mr. Saris can continue to work on getting those planning dollars in place that comes solely from the county. Okay, so, and that's, that's my last question for you tonight at this moment in time, okay. is what projects have we planned for on this list? Because you had made that, I remember that very clearly from our discussion last year. We were like, county plans, county pays for the planning money, but the state says, okay, we're gonna we're gonna help you out with these projects, right? So, so the planning's occurring, or has occurred. I guess that's my question because I'm looking at the um, the FY 2020 capital budget, the final one from last year, right? Yes, sir. And it's got the county money on it, mm -hmm. but I, I see a bunch of zeros in all the planning. Did that already occur? Um, let me try. Let me try to answer that question. Your question is a very good question. It is. Thank you. It is for this reason that we have to be very careful about our list consistency of this list, because the planning process is a long process. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes anywhere from 18 to 24 months before we start this. Since the since the inception of the process, we work closely with county. We work closely with the state, as long as we are communicating that in the board approved list, this appears on fourth or fifth priority. County is flexible in giving us funding based on the credibility that superintendent's team has established with county. If we keep changing it every year, then we cannot start all the planning process in different phases. So by the time state money comes, our planning would have been done even though it takes long time. So different schools are in different stages of planning. Right, and, and I guess just to kind of close the loop on this one, since I see zero planning dollars here, yeah. have we already done the planning for many of these the projects? The state submission that you are see seeing I'm looking at the uh, one from last year that's got blue and orange In some on it. cases, we may, have, we may have already gotten planning money from the county to start the planning process because they also understand that if we don't start planning on time, we won't be able to meet the schedule right. that we are attempting to get. So at some point, you'll start getting A's and B's and C's on the different board approvals. 
And that's what it means, that by a certain date, they expect certain phase of planning to be completed. If we don't start ahead of time, we won't be able to meet that timeline. So it's a quite complex process. No, I, I, I follow you. Yeah. I just don't see any planning money anywhere on last year's both county and state budget. Because as part of the process, we always put planning money as part of the county share and did not show separately. Uh, okay, I'm looking at the one that has both the county share yeah. and the state share. That's why I'm asking the question very carefully because I see all the little P's type of approval planning, right? Mm -hmm. And it's zero straight across. Yeah. But my assumption would be that there's been some level of planning that yes. has already taken place. That's already taken place. And, and the right? planning funds are part of the county. The share. county funds, and yes. I'm, I'm not seeing them. That's it's, why I'm it's asking. It's part of the, the, the project funding. If you look at the project, and if not in the project, then they have forward funded that planning. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ms. Pasture. Okay, thank you. Give me the shortest answer because I, I know I'm babbling here, but I wanna go back to what, how Ms. Rose started. Mm -hmm. And I just want the short answer so I know how this fits because Last year, when we talked about priorities, mm -hmm. I admit that I didn't know, I, you know, going by what I'm, I'm reading. But in the uh, time since then, having been able to visit schools, mm -hmm. hear people, and, and get reports, I know at least one school, yes, and we've talked about that, right? Yes. That doesn't appear on the list that is in great need, but for whatever reason, it has never until now been brought before the board or anyone else, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, for the myriad of things that need to happen there. So going back to Ms. Rose's question and maybe others, how do you get when we're dealing with what appears to be fairly fixed? I understand this, mm -hmm. but how do we put in um, some things and some work that might need to happen for a school that doesn't appear here? Does that come under this long-term plan? How do we get that on? Because I, I, I really need to advocate for the school. Short answer. Yes, ma'am. The 10-year capital plan will capture anything that is not currently on the capital plan. It should be incorporated into that. And from that, it should start feeding your subsequent annual capital submissions. The way it is now, these projects have more from community input and engagement moving forward. The school that you're speaking of, Ms. Rowe, and I can go around this diocese, would be incorporated in the 10-year capital plan, and, and there will be community input about how they're ranked and how they're ordered so that in the future years, you almost, this almost creates itself from the 10-year capital plan because what you start doing is you start peeling the projects as they're on the big lot roster into this. We just have not, we don't have that document previously that have gotten us to this place. But these were priorities at some other points in time. The goal is to complete those, and the 10-year capital plan is how you complete these projects and get those others queued up to be a future capital project. I tried to make it short. You did, and, and I thank you. And it, it was clear, um, but you just said that these came to the list some other point in time. What? What do we do now? Where are we? How do I know? How does Ms. Rowe know? How does anyone else know? When are we going to put these schools forward? And then what would, are we looking at that 18-month process? Or do, do we wait until everything on this list is done, which could be years, and then we start? So what is our time frame and process so for making that happen? So let's quickly deconstruct what the 10-year capital plan will look like. Uh -huh. I'm going to do this very quickly. Okay. You don't have to identify, I have this school. We are going to go into every school. The consultant is going to go into every school and say, okay, let's work it and see where it needs to go. And it's going to get a priority score. 
as we move forward. So you do that for every single school that we have. So you, you may have your own individual list, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But this process is going to be completely about a comprehensive approach to a 10-year capital plan. So it doesn't negate your list, but your lists are going to be incorporated into what we're going to do the work. And I'm saying we because we haven't identified who that group is going to be. So it's we until it's them. And then it'll be whoever that may be. So it's what, so we're going to evaluate each individual school as it relates to needs, whether it relates for uh, infrastructure, seats, programming, whatever that case may be. And then that's going to that's going to create some kind of a criteria, I don't want to say score, some kind of criteria to say this project will be in category A, this project will be in category B, this project will be in category C. And from that, the discussions will say how many from category A did you move forward to priority ranking? How many from category B? How many from category C? How many from, from category D? And then that's how you feed this document in future years by doing a comprehensive dissection of all of your school centers and programs. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Smith. Mr. McMillian. Don't we already have some of that information? Because right. didn't we talk about we have some of that that will shortcut this whole process. We don't have to go through all 174 schools. The, the, wh whoever, whoever the consultants are that we hire, they're going to have at least two documents, possibly three. They're going to have the, the facilities assessment that was done in 2014. They're going to have the high school study that was done. So those two documents, now certainly they're going to still do their own due diligence. But what it should, what it should do is they don't have to start at A. They may be further along in that pendulum of what they'll have to do. They're still going to have to verify and recheck to see whether or not anything new has happened that will, that will potentially uh, accelerate. For example, the enrollment um, explosions that have happened in your Pleasant Plains. That would be a criteria to say, oh, I know where it's ranked in here, but it may need to move into a different category because of its more immediate needs. So they'll use the documents that we have. We'll provide that to them as uh, points of, of where we start. They will consult robustly with Mr. Dixon and his team who know those buildings like the back of their hands. They'll engage principals and school communities to make sure they have a full understanding of the programs. They'll work with Ms. McComas and the community soups on what the programs are going to be in those schools. We'll work closely with um, the draw folks on planning and enrollment. So all of those things will be incorporated into the, into the study. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Smith, to dovetail with um what Mr. McMillian was uh, asking. So we do have a 2014 facilities assessment mm -hmm. plan, which is countywide comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, one of the questions um, is, is that going to be updated prior to or during the 10-year capital construction planning process? Um, I, I, I don't necessarily know where we are with that because um, until you hire the consultant, the consultant may say, we, we want to take this document and continue it, or they may want to say, we value it, but we, we still have to do our due diligence to make sure that we can accurately de deliver a product. What I will say is, I think at the end of it, each building would get its own workup that may germinate from this. This, this. this document may be the catalyst of that, but it may go further. Pete may have I think you have covered most of it. I just want to make sure that you understand each and every piece of information that we have in any form will be shared with them. S some of the information needs to be updated. In last five years, we have done a lot of work that is not included in GWWO. In last five years, we have done a lot of conversation about what our needs are. They will know everything. I mean, in the last five this years, we have air conditioned just about 50% right. of the building. Right. We have built more than a dozen schools right. that were not in that GWW right. study. So it will be updated in one form or the other. Exactly what shape they may start mini study of their own using GWWO's information, or they may just update GWWO based on the information we provide them. 
Okay, and also when we've been talking about the 10-year capital construction plan, which as a board member I'm so grateful for because um, it's been discussed on the board for three years, and so we're in a great place with the county executive and the county council on board and uh, with this board of education with our new superintendent all working together on this. Could you just go through the timeline um, based on other districts that have done a 10-year capital plan, the, the timeline of getting the 10-year the capital construction plan done? Is it getting eight the months? Development or? of the plan or? Yes. Oh, is it an eight month it, process? It varies on, okay. um, of course, the size of the capital program, which we have a relatively large capital program. It also varies from the standpoint of there may not be a document such as this, which is the facilities assessment and or the recent high school study that is already there. So it could range anywhere from eight months to 24 months, but we're hoping with some of the documents we have here, we can contract some of that, we can, some of that time based on some of the information we currently have and the knowledge that we have of, of our existing buildings that will provide resources to whatever firm we, we ultimately land with that bring to, comes to the board. Okay, thank you. Did I see Ms. Mack? Mr. Smith, this, this, will the new plan include a proactive preventative maintenance component so that as we have all of these new elementary schools, will we be monitoring them so we don't let them get so bad that the fix will be more expensive? I, I'm not going to answer that because I know Mr. Dixon's been waiting to answer that for 15 years, oh, so I I'm won't so do it. I'm so happy that Go I asked ahead. the question. Well, the, pro, the purpose of the program is to develop capital program but it doesn't prevent us from asking and adding to the work that give us preventive maintenance program. But regardless of the capital program, we have been working on our own to initiate preventive maintenance program based on the resources available to us. In all of this conversation, we haven't talked about the available resources. Even with the development of the capital program, if the resources remain the same, number of years that it'll take to, to complete that recommendation, maybe 15, 20, 30 years, we don't know. So it's a, how much maintenance did we, do we do and how much preventive maintenance do we do is availability of resources. Based on the available resources, we have started an active preventive maintenance program. As a matter of fact, just in last year alone, there were five positions added for the sole purpose of performing preventive maintenance. So I just wanted to share that with the board. And would you say those five that were added were about how old? I mean, the, you're talking about schools, right? The, the positions, five people were FTEs. old. Oh, five. FTEs. Oh, great. FTEs. Okay, that's right. great. Yeah. Um, because when I know we have so many needs, mm -hmm. but I also know that even new schools will have problems, and yes. it's it, we get to the point of, no return when the repairs become so expensive. Yes. And, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir by the no, look on your no, face. Absolutely. You have a good point. It's just, it's just that the more resources we have, and with new technology, it's even better, bigger challenge. As you know, that the change in technology has been so extensive in the last five to 10 years that to find folks who are trained in that technology is a challenge. So with the board's support, yeah. Looking at it. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Other board members? Ms. Rowe? I just wanted to know if we have a lot of other questions, if we can submit them in writing. Yes. Okay, Please thank you. Them in, in I did have one question, though, if I could ask this one now. Um, the three projects at the top of the list. The footnote says that they were forward funding, and my understanding is that those ones were forward funded only because we were already in contract and in process of building those projects at the point the new county executive said we were not going to forward fund anymore. Is it still the county's position that we are not going to forward fund? Um, that, that answer is yes, based on what where, where the county executive said, mm -hmm. I'm for funding all of these projects. Don't have that in front of me right now, but they are represented right, here in the capital. Right, but those three, but after that. After that, he's gonna re- No more forward funding. He's gonna re, 
investigate that at his next budget cycle related to capital dollars. So, so um, we don't really know then. We don't really know that because there was a request this time with the General Assembly to get additional dollars to move that forward. I believe that's going to be the county's primary focus for this coming year from the county executive to get those additional state dollars. Okay, so for the last fiscal year, the policy was no forward funding for this fiscal year. Should we assume then that it's going to stay the same unless the county executive says something different? There has been no change that no we change know that, of, we, that know we know. So of. that's the policy now. Yes. It okay. wasn't a policy that was detached from the county's fiscal resources. It was uh, after an assessment of their ability to finance their current debt levels um, and with the operating expenses that that along with debt service brought about the tax increase. So it was in that environment considering all their resources that they had no more resources for forward funding. It was not simply a decision, we don't like it, we're not doing it. No, I understand, but that's still the decision now? That's still the current policy? Is that As correct? far as we that's, know. That's okay. still the current philosophy. That the county executive currently has until we can re till he can reevaluate where his financial projections are showing him based on our debt load. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. One last very easy question: okay. um, When are we going to start, and/or have we already contracted this 10-year plan activity out? Um, we've already started the process um, in viewing multiple other districts who have a 10 year capital plan. So we've already done that. We've met with the teams, with our the, the superintendent's team and the county teams on what components we went in, we want in there. Now we're trying to develop the scope of work. And then at that point in time, the superintendent will start sharing that with the board about are these the criteria that you were expecting to see? And if it's others that need to be there, we can do that before we issue the, the RFP to move forward. So that's being developed, but it's a few steps we have to do before we can actually put together the finalized scope of work. That's what Pete and the county teams are working on based on uh, best practices and uh, others that we've seen that have been successful across the country. So when will that be completed so we can actually start? We don't have a date yet, but we're, 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 we don't have any reason to delay. So we're, we're going as fast as possible, but this is a sort of a new process to Baltimore County. So I think the goal is to do it right, not so much fast. We want to do it, we want to do it the correct way, but we're, we will certainly update the superintendent as soon as we get to a point where we have a document ready to move forward for review by this board. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you so much for all of the uh, preparation that you've done on this and also uh, the preparation you've done in advance and for answering all the questions this evening. Um, there were some additional questions that were sent in uh, towards the end of last week. And um, if there's any that you're able to answer tonight, that would be great. Otherwise, I understand that they're going to be uh, submitted to the full board. Yep. And I forget, As, I failed to mention that we, we had received questions from the board. We answered some of those, but there were some follow-up questions that we, we just didn't have time to put together for tonight. But we'll work with the superintendent to move those forward and to you guys once we get them. And if you have some that have stemmed from tonight, certainly I think the superintendent has instructed us to be poised to be able to address those questions as we move forward. Okay, thank you for that. And just as a um, reminder that the board will vote on the fiscal year 2021 state capital budget at the September 10th meeting. So we look forward to additional answers and discussion uh, that you'll be providing. And Dr. Williams did uh, just say this evening that if board members have additional questions to please uh, get them to him in writing um, as soon as you're able. So with that, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is item M, board committee updates. And with that, I will uh, start over on this side with Ms. Mack for curriculum committee. 
Thank you. Um, on August 14th, Rod McMillian, John Offerman, and I visited Carver Tech to tour the student IT tech program where BCPS students were hired to work with BCPS staff to facilitate the inventorying, troubleshooting, cleaning, repairing, and shipping of student devices. I'd like to thank Dr. McComas um, for inviting the curriculum committee members to see this great work in action. I'd also like to thank BCPS staff for creating this in-house opportunity for our students to learn a skill and learn actually about the process of working and all while earning a salary. Um, I'd like to thank our student host for walking us through the process and I can say that it was one of the most um, favorite event that I have attended as a board member, so I thank you. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Pasture for the Committee for Legislative and Government Relations. The uh, Government and Legislative Affairs Committee will meet in October, and we are going to be very proactive this year in involving ourselves one with uh, the current commission, particularly uh, the committee that is looking at funding, keeping in mind that Senate Bill 1030 uh, gave or established the blueprint for Maryland's future. So a lot of the things about which we have spoken tonight will be attached uh, to that, uh, providing funding uh, which the governor uh, signed off on without his signature or gave permission to move forward without his signature, but understanding that we're looking at uh, funding for uh, particular populations and that uh, Senate, uh, Senate President Miller and Speaker of the House Jones initiated in June 2019 a funding formula uh, work group and I am pleased to be on that work group to present recommendations to the legislature prior to the 2020 session. So our Government and Legislative Affairs Committee will be looking at that as well as assessing our local um, interests and concerns for this particular legislative session. I do encourage everyone to stay on top of what happens with uh, the current commission and particularly that funding group. We will be pretty much finished with the formula, uh, hopefully by the beginning of October so that we can give it to the legislature so they can process and we can have dialogue and be prepared to present an understanding as um, uh, Ms. Seroff pointed out about um, contradictions that the, we all have contradictions. She certainly does if you see her on stage, a different person, um, bravo to her. But understanding that that is in fact the heart of what Kerwin is going to, taking a look at the contradictions that all of our children, all of us have, and making sure that we are able, regardless of, of um, economics, poverty levels, uh, whether they have um, gifts in very different ways or in need of special education services that we are able to embrace and herald the beauty of our individual contradictions. So I really encourage everyone to stay abreast of what is happening this year in Annapolis concerning funding for all of our school systems. It is critical, as you've just heard, to the survival and the success of our young people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pester, for all of your efforts on behalf of the uh, school children of Baltimore County, but also your work is going to be very important across the state, so we appreciate that. Um, Mr. Kuhn for the uh, Audit Committee. So the Audit Committee met on August 13th to discuss activities associated with the Internal Audit Group. Um, 
the new business that was reviewed was a discussion of the FY19 accomplishment. And then we went into closed uh, administrative function uh, for the rest of the time. That's all I have. Thank you. And um, as chair of the policy review committee, I do want to let people know that our first meeting at the start of the new school year will be on September 16th. And the agenda for all of our committee meetings are posted on the website in advance of those meetings. And then also the minutes are available on our website as well. For the policy review committee, uh, I do just want to thank uh, board member Mr. Offerman for the work that he's been doing on a number of initiatives over the summer. Uh, one of them that is going to be discussed at the upcoming meeting September 16th is uh, one of the things that he has started working on related to the cell phone um, policy development and information that is uh, being pulled together. So we appreciate Dr. Wheatley uh, Phillips and her group that's contributing to that. We also appreciate Dr. Williams having other staff support this issue and also um, Mr. Omar Rashid to bring to this in, uh, this development uh, the student voice because as we know it's um, technology is very important to our students today and so it's going to be vital to understand the impact of what we do on the policy review committee on all of our stakeholders including our students. So we invite people to look on the website, find out what the agendas are and they can always email the board uh, questions or comments that they have related to that. And that brings us to the next item which is item N, information. Included in the board docs information available to the public is uh, several items related to updates on superintendent's rules, including Superintendent Rule 1260, community relations, community involvement, and school volunteers. There's also Superintendent's Rule 1270, community relations, parent and family engagement. Rule 4104, personnel conduct related to technology acceptable use policy for employees and approved non-employees. Also, Rule 4500 related to personnel, temporary employment, and substitute teachers. Superintendent's Rule 5550, students conduct, student behavior code. Also, um, Superintendent's Rule 8130, which supports the policy, internal board policies, organization formulation. So anyone can go to the uh, board docs and see those updated rules. And finally, the last item for this evening is announcements. And I just want to state that the next board meeting is Tuesday, September 10th, 6.30 p.m. here in this building. And we do just wish everyone uh, exciting last end of the summer. And for everyone, get the students, get your reading done. And for the parents, buy all those supplies. And we appreciate all of the work that's been done by our 12-month employees. And we are so excited to greet our new teachers tomorrow. So everyone, we're really looking forward to the start of a new school year. Thank you very much.